Thank you all for coming this evening. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure to have you all here. Uh, thanks for the support from the school, um, and also in particular, Alan Gaida and, and Lisa Apolinski for helping put this event on. Really, really pleased, uh, really pleased to have Joshua Prince Ramos here this evening uh, to speak with us for a, a bit about his work and, and the state of affairs in architecture today. Um, Alan's going to say a few words and we'll go from there. Thanks again. So it's rare that I uh, ever find all of you in one room, and uh, with that, a few people have asked me to make some announcements. Uh, AIS is having a uh, napkin sketch auction. Uh, it's going to be held on May 4th, and uh, some sketches include uh, some household architecture names like Stephen Hall, Caesar Pelli, of course, Bjark Ingalls, uh, and more, and maybe Joshua Prince Ramos can uh, contribute as well. <laughs> Um, so, apparently we're on Twitter and we're live uh, via live feed. Uh, you can hashtag NSAD lecture or hashtag slow arc. Uh, Lisa, thanks for that. Um, and uh, now I guess uh, introduce a man that needs no introduction, but I have to do it anyway. Uh, after founding OMA in New York before renaming it to Rex, our speaker tonight has been described as a savior of American architecture. Um, additionally, he has been identified as one of the world's most influential young architects. With notable projects such as the Seattle Central Library, AT&T Performing Arts Center, and the Vaco Fashion Media Center in Turkey, it's easy to see how his contributions to the fashion profession has uh, gotten him a little bit of recognition. Um, with that said, NSAD, I proudly present to you Joshua Prince. Thank you. Thank you. So, first, thank you very much. Um, very warm invitation. Um, I need to make one. Actually, you mind turning it down just a little bit, the, the reverb? Um, I need to make one apology as I start, which is. Uh, when I lecture, I get excited, and when I get excited, I swear. Um, so for all of you viewing at home, this would be like uh, Valerie Yanni in Seattle. This would be a good moment to get little Valerie out of the room. Um, slow architecture. The name, uh, unfortunately, the uh, green movement has gotten to it before me, and I'm desperately trying to co-opt it back from them. But this is not meant to be a lecture about uh, green design. And, I will say a brief moment about that, which is simply, it's because I don't believe in it. It's not that I don't believe in sustainability, I just don't believe that sustainability should become a brand that you put on architecture. If it ain't sustainable, it ain't architecture, and just shut up about it after that. Um, so, slow architecture. Slow architecture, what I hope to impress upon you is I think that we're in a moment in architecture where we need to start slowing down and letting ideas gestate more. Now, this has occurred to us in our practice in the last six months, largely to do um, with a firm that we've been working with who's been involved. Did you all catch that? No, I don't think so. That happened very quickly, didn't it? I'm not allowed to talk about who that is. Um, so you've seen all I will say. But they are an entity that has been uh, very focused on speed and mass production for about 50 years. And they are now starting to realize that they'd be better suited to focus their uh, st strategic thinking on ways in which their architecture can evolve over time, where it can be malleable, where it is a much more considered thing than instead focusing their strategy on how can I produce it very quickly. And given what they do and the term that we use to discuss them, out of the inverse of that came the concept of slow architecture. I think that we are primed at this moment in architectural history to do this kind of thing because we've been suffering under a regime for the last 100 years of form versus function. Now, there have been times in which we have sided with formalism. There's been times in which we have sided with functionalism. In my opinion, all of them have been bad because they've always come at the detriment of the other. And I think right now, largely to do with the downturn of the economy, people are starting to think about practice again. 
And as much as we'd like to say, hey, the times are bad, I actually think this is the salvation moment for us because if we'd kept going down this road, we would have gotten to a really bad place. We are now at a moment in which we can actually stitch these two back together. Maybe we can, ah, there we can. And talk instead about form versus function, simply talk about performance. By performance, I mean the moment in which architecture can be doing things. And that's all we should focus on. And I don't care if it's doing things formally, and I don't care if it's doing things functionally. What I care about is it's doing them both, it's doing it a lot, and it's doing it well. And that's how we should be talking about architecture. And if we do that, then we as architects can start putting agenda back into architecture. So if I could diagram this in any way, it would be something that looks kind of like this, that we need to be thinking iteratively, we need to be thinking in two spheres. One is thinking about a project's constraints and how to optimize them and manipulate them in order to create the environment through which we're going to throughput our design. And we need to be thinking about our agenda. What is it we want this thing to do? And both of those things will be moving as we are designing iteratively, as we are working slowly, eventually to find the optimum relationship between the two. And in my experience, that will always create something remarkable, always create something that is a one-off, that is totally cited to its context, cited to its constraints, that makes hopefully extraordinary, not necessarily extraordinary, but extraordinary architecture. If I could uh, now, for those of us who are more visually inclined than uh, uh, argumentatively inclined, I'll show this now in a really kind of dumb way. I think this is how we currently practice. Right, we come to something with our own a priori concept of what we want to do, and we roll that thing up to the gates of Troy, and we can't figure out why they won't let us in, right? like them being the client. Well, it's because you're a 40-foot wooden Spartan with a spear in their face. Of course they won't let you in. You need to be thinking about how to craft what you want. And again, personally, I'm much more f uh, focused on typological invention. Others are more focused on form. I don't care, I don't care what your agenda is, but figure out a way to roll it up to the gates of Troy, your client, in a way that they're like, hey, come on in. Don't be in their face. Now the only thing I'd like to ask you is, please don't carry the metaphor any further, please don't fill it full of angry Spartans with spears. Whatever you deliver, deliver something that is benign at least, but I would argue deliver maidens. Okay, that's the metaphor. Now, as I go through different projects, I'm going to do it by showing first, well, I'm going to do it by belaboring our process. And our process has three components. And I'm going to talk about each project this way over and over and over again. Sorry for the pedantism of it. But it takes the following form. First, we figure out what are the core issues of the project. Second, with our client, we define what are the joint positions we want to take. You could call this creating the agenda. And then third, only once we have established those joint positions that we can all critique the project on, then we can come at it with uh, architectural manifestations. Only then, right? We don't get to design until the problem is clear. Our experience has been, if we do this, and if we constantly eschew sort of standard ways of thinking about things and look for unconventional solutions, things that are truly specific, we will arrive at solutions they always surpass anything we could have initially or individually conceived of. To date, we haven't fucked up, right? Maybe we are. I always have a student who will say, well, what happens if it doesn't work? All I can say is so far it hasn't failed. It might. That will be an interesting learning experience for us. Um, so with that, I'm actually going to start with the project that was the genesis of all this, um, which is now almost 13 years ago when we started it. Um, and it was when I was just starting OMA New York uh, with Rem Kohlhaas. And we started the Seattle Central Library in 1999. It was in a very exciting moment to be doing the project in Seattle. For me particularly, I'm from Seattle, so that was exciting and scary. I kept thinking about my mother getting stoned in the grocery store. Um, but it was exciting because Seattle was at the height of the tech bubble. So there was an enormous amount of money, enormous amount of exuberance for this project, but there was also really bizarrely competing notions of what a library should be. Very antiquated modern uh, notion of, hey, it should look like a Carnegie library with big stone columns. And then there were people like Microsoft who were saying, why are you spending $111 million on a building when we're spending billions trying to make the book disappear? It doesn't make any sense. 
And it was in that context that we kind of went, now I'm really going to start swearing, I apologize, but we went like, oh shit, what are we doing? We don't know what we're doing. How do we, we have to be able to answer to the populace of these two complete competing notions. So we asked the client, hey, let's all step back and think for a bit so we don't get nailed to a cross in six months. And they were like, good, let's all do that. That was the first moment that we started to do this idea of define the core issues and take positions on them. So I'm going to show you what the issues and positions were. This was the first issue. It was a contentious one when we first showed it. And the issue simply said, Contemporary libraries, and this is now not so contemporary, but 10 years ago, were dealing with two simultaneous explosions, having one to do with media and having one to do with social responsibility. That was the first issue. The second was this. Uh, we were noticing that contemporary libraries were using an old antiquated notion of flexibility, kind of one size fits all, high modernist flexibility. Just make empty spaces and hey, you know, you put the reading room there and eventually it'll change and it'll become the magazine area and so forth. And what we were seeing is that it made very nondescript buildings and worse, because there were these two competing explosions, the media was getting priority and it was moving the social function out of the building. And so what you see on the right was actually what we were seeing. The future was always kind of media laden and social responsibility was pushed out. And so we proposed, this is our first position, let's divide and conquer. Let's make compartments in which we do only one thing really well. And we'll put the more unstable elements, things whose evolutions we couldn't define on top of these compartments, and we'll put the things whose evolutions we could predict inside. That was our first major position. And we presented it to the library board, and they said, no. You're like, why? Because well, we don't actually believe this is a problem. Interesting, now I'll show in a second why we disagreed, but what was interesting is we were having a very, very sophisticated conversation about architecture without any stuff, right? We weren't showing them a building. We were talking about the essence of what this building had to do. They simply said, look, our mission is media. It is not social responsibility. Fair enough. It's not our role to tell them they're wrong. However, we had been doing something behind our backs that they didn't know about, and that was the creation of this diagram. What you're seeing on the left, that is just a bar chart of the stuff they gave us. Now, we didn't question that stuff because we said we're not library scientists. It's not our role. Our role as architects is to be a mirror and to say, hey, are you sure that what you think you're doing is what you're actually doing? So the moment, the kind of aha moment, you won't really see it here, but was this diagram, the second one. What we should showed them back is we said, you say that the media explosion is what's important but not the social function. You guys have spent 10 years creating a facility program and weirdly, it's only one third media and it's two thirds social. Sounds to me like you guys have changed and you do think that this is a problem. The problem actually is that you don't recognize it. They were shocked. They told us to go away. <laughs> then they asked us to come back. And they said, you're right. So they gave us license to recombine their program into cardinal things and to redivide that program based on this idea of compartmentalized flexibility, which is the diagram on the right. And then to their complete surprise, what they didn't know is that that diagram was loaded with a whole bunch of things that we knew already. We had them sign the diagram. We had them sign the 50 pages of spreadsheets that came with it. And then we came back three weeks later and said, ha ha, this is it. <laughs> um, but if you look, what we showed them is literally just the diagram on the right. right? It has uh, four uh, unstable programs on the left and five stable boxes on the right. And when you see the building, it is literally just that. The one is underground, second one is at ground, third, fourth, fifth box. Those are the stable programs and then the more unstable programs in between. And then we skinned it and that was it. That was the design. So when you experience the building, what was exciting to us is that this notion of creating compartmentalized uh, boxes, things that solve very discrete problems in a very high performance way, is that it created something that was actually incredibly urban. When you walk through this building, you see it on the outside, you go from different environment to different environment to different environment. So here's a box. This happens to be the kind of area they orchestrate all the books. This is the auditorium into the main living room. This is one of the unstable spaces up into the meeting platform, a specific space, up into uh, the mixing chamber, an uh, uh, unstable space, then into the kind of infamous book spiral, and from there 
up into the public reading room. All right, so that's the first one. Now, start to go maybe even faster into the next ones. Issue, position, manifestation. This is the Dallas, uh, it's Dallas Theater Center, AT&T Performing Arts Center in Dallas, uh, which we started in 2004. Client, again, had a very interesting problem, and it was that. That was their problem. At least so they saw. It was just, you know, we're in a horrible little shitty building. We want to replace it. So we went happily about planning on how to replace it until we suddenly realized something really daunting, that that horrible little building was the reason the Dallas Theater Center was a really important theater company. Dallas, who, who does theater in Dallas? Why would that make sense? But actually, the Dallas Theater Center had become notorious nationwide for being one of the most important theater companies. And at first, why would the best artistic directors, scenic designers, talent, why would they go to Dallas when they could be in New York and Chicago and Seattle? Well, they went, weirdly enough, we think, because of that building. That building was so bad that the, the managing director let people do whatever they wanted to do it. So they would do a cherry orchard and they'd bring a backo in and they'd build a 30, a, dig a 30 foot hole to the middle of the stage. You could try and do that in the American Airlines Theater in Broadway and you'd be shot just for suggesting it. So the reason I say it's daunting is that we as architects were in the uh, unhappy role of potentially building a new pristine building that would kill the quality that had allowed this theater company to become important. So that was the first issue, and our position was, let's not do that. Let's figure out a way to make a new building that was just as malleable as the existing building. The second issue is a bit of a, a nuance of the first one. They were what was called a multi-form theater company. That means on any given night, they would perform in proscenium, thrust, traverse, round, flat floor, and so forth. When this building was first built in the 60s, that was fine because labor was cheap and they would just go in and they tear it out and rebuild it and so forth. Well, as labor got more expensive, they couldn't do that anymore and eventually they had to freeze the building in what they called a thrustinium, a kind of bastard organization. So the second position was we had to figure out how to use the capital cost that we were given for the building and make sure that we spent it in a way that they could still do this in the future, be multiform without depending on operational costs, because operational costs are now hard to come by in the world that we live in, operational budgets. The concept was dumb in a way, on our first blush, and that was to take front of house and back of house and reconfigure it as above house and below house. Seems weird and silly, you might not know why at first, but its purpose was to do this, what we like to call superfly. By superfly, what we meant is to take all those freedoms that you normally associate with a fly tower and actually smear them out over the stage. And that would allow us to have anything that was pristine inside the theater environment could be pulled up, and that would leave an environment left that you could uh, drill, cut, nail, glue, and do whatever else you want to at a very low cost and uh, very high efficiency uh, so that they now have a, both a, a transformable environment and a malleable environment. There was also a repercussion of that, which you see here with the idea of the stage actually extending out. Once we moved all these things that normally constrain the auditorium, we could also allow the artistic director the freedom to totally redefine suspension of disbelief, to engage the real world during a performance, and I'll discuss that later. So here you see the building. There's the auditorium. Uh, these are the four configurations that they can do with two stage hands in 15 minutes proscenium, thrust, flat floor, and studio theater. But what was interesting to us was not to be able to do the, the, we had to do these perfectly, perfectly in terms of sight lines, acoustics, performance. But the test was, could we actually throw a bunch of other things at it and see that it did those well as well? Did those well as well. That's a funny way of expressing that. Um, and so we made, you know, arena traverses are more difficult, and then we made up our own, bipolar and sandwich. That usually draws laughs, but I guess not. <laughs> in San Diego. Um, <laughs> now here you see a cross section of the building. This is flat floor. I want you to see what happens as we go through the three most important configurations. This is the flat floor. That's proscenium. And now this is the important thing, is it goes from proscenium to thrust. All right, what you notice is that when it goes from proscenium to thrust, I'll go back a second, proscenium to thrust, is that it doesn't seem like it's such a big change, but in fact, in terms of real architecture, it's pretty remarkable because Elements of the, of the seating have to literally go from one rake 
to a different orientation in a different rake, and things where they're seating have to actually disappear and become flat. And most importantly, the sides, the balconies, have to actually move into a different position. And the way that was ultimately done, we had a super smart client, and they said, hey, we're not going to beta test anything, so you need to be able to figure out a way to do this with known technology. Uh, we moved the balcony towers that weigh between 12 and 16 tons using a scoreboard lift. So there you see the scoreboard lift. Allows the balconies to go into different configurations and to be flown completely out of the space. And we moved everything on the front of house, uh, front, in the auditorium side, the seating side, using technology that's normally associated with the stage side, uh, with actually the stage side of an opera house. And these are stage lifts, and they allow the floor to take different rakes and to spin. The combination of those then allows you to do something like this to go from, this is a proscenium configuration, this is a flat floor configuration, um, this was us doing something like Cirque du Soleil in the middle of it, uh, suspending something over the seating. This was something that was a bastardization of everything. It, it was partial flat floor, partial thrust, partial um, traverse. And then here you see, this is actually the first time we ever did it. Uh, so I said two stage hands in 15 minutes. This is about 40 people in about three hours, and we're literally running around trying to find stuff and taking a lunch break, and we should move the hand off the center. But I think it gives you a sense of the notion of this thing as a big transformer. And our intent then, as architects, was if we used our hand correctly, we would be able to supplant our hand with the hand of the artist artistic director give the artistic director a tool that encourages them to be creative, not a tool that actually subjugates them to our vision. It gets a little slow here, so in a second I'll just advance it, but you get the idea. And now I said that there was an interesting follow-on, and that was how the perimeter then also opened up and allowed the artistic director to play with notions of suspension of disbelief. And what I mean by that is, right now in a conventional auditorium, they have find it very difficult for you to apply the last act of Macbeth to your real world. In this building, suddenly they can actually do that at will. And here you see the perimeter. We have acoustic uh, glass walls that actually hit an STC of 57, which means you could basically drive a semi-truck with its air brakes right next to the building, and you wouldn't hear anything on the inside. What look like curtains is actually a trompe l'oeil effect. Those are operable blackout shades that are in the glass. So that you can be inside the auditorium, completely hermetically enclosed, not see anything, not hear anything. And if the artistic director wants, without allowing sound to come in, they can open up the entire thing. So suddenly you can relate the parable on stage with your real life, if they choose. They can even go a step further. Well, in this case, this is the potential to allow things happening on stage to work in the other way, to actually have people on the outside make relationships to things on the inside. But in fact, they can even open up the entire perimeter to the exterior. That's both so that you want to do a streetcar named Desire and you want to drive a motorcycle directly from the outside inside, you can do it. But it also allows them now to stage intermissions and entry sequences in new ways. So in the end, this is the tool that we provided them. It was multi-form could do a series of different from proscenium thrust, flat floor traverse, and anything else they could imagine. But we also made it multi-procession, and they could start to mix and match. So in the end, there you see the building. This is the uh, sequence as we defined it. But you could also have the entire building open, for instance, in uh, a Wagnerian, which means the back opens. So you can open the entire thing and do Greek. So this is really the potential it gives the artistic director, that you could have the first act, the entry, be in, in this case, Wagnerian, first act in thrust, intermission in Greek, second act in arena, and then last, everyone goes out through the sort of scripted uh, procession that we had designed. There you see the final product. All right, now I'm going to give you a sad story. Uh, this is Museum Plaza. This is a project that we started in 2006. Uh, it started construction in 2008, and then it was put on hold right after it started construction. We'd done all the foundation work uh, when the bond market crashed because it was a project that was financed based on bonds. Um, we had an amazing client, super, super smart client, uh, husband and wife who were very committed to revitalization of Louisville. 
Uh, she happens to be the heiress of the Brown Form and Liquor Fortune. They also are very committed to contemporary art, and they wanted to revitalize downtown by gifting a contemporary art center into the center of the city. And they wanted to spend about $30 million on it. One of the things they understood was that $30 million was going to get them the building, but you would also need to have an endowment equal to that in order for this to be a vital institution. And they weren't going to give $60 million. So they asked us, is there a way that you can conceive of a for-profit development that when it's finished will do two things. It will, as part of its construction cost, have this contemporary art center in it and make $30 million in profit. So we'll get our investment back. And then we will turn around and gift it back to the city or to the institution as its endowment. It's actually super smart. Um, but also as an architect, a bit daunting particularly given that one of the reasons they thought they could afford to do that is they wanted to do it on this site. And this site has everything wrong with it you could imagine, and they got it for $1. And I'll show you in a second why they got it for $1. Amongst other things, this is a reason. Uh, it floods up to 25 feet about two or three times a year. Um, aside from the fact that it is on the wrong side of the flood wall and next to an elevated freeway, um, they got it for $1. Now I'm going to design the building for you very quickly in front of you. Um, and then I'm going to go back and explain what the issues and the positions were. So here you see downtown Louisville. Um, this is the first issue is that actually it wasn't uh, one site. It was actually three different parcels of land. Let's turn the optimal resolution off. It happens to sit next to the Muhammad Ali Center, which is a very important building for downtown Louisville. This is where it gets exciting. This is the 30-foot high concrete flood wall that you were just standing on the other side of, and the Ohio River floods into that two or three times a year. Now it gets a bit crazy. This is the uh, I-64. This is the main east-west vehicular corridor of Louisville. So now you see that we're in a loud, wet bucket. Um, this is 7th Avenue. Uh, 7th connects from downtown. It's the main arterial connection to the freeway, so it actually bisects two of the sites. And the third one is on the other side of the flood wall. This is where it gets downright silly. This is the Louisville Gas and Electric Duct Bank. So this supplies all power to downtown Louisville, um, which if we had damaged it in any way would knock all power out to Louisville for about nine months. And then almost as a joke, the city said, oh yeah, and you also have to put an east-west connection for pedestrians. I'm like, really? <laughs> so uh, working with a developer component with the client, we collectively identified that it had to be about 1.1 million square feet of development to make the $30 million that we're talking about. And it had to be mixed use, so we didn't oversaturate the market. Um, and if we would accept planning convention, we would take all the public components, and we would create a plinth, because in America, we love to do plinth and tower projects. So we would make a plinth, and we would stick it in that middle of the loud, wet bucket. So now we would have contemporary art that was flooded on a daily basis. And because we were trying to pay for this, we would have to make these things very simple towers, and we would stick them directly on top. And at this moment, we would get fired. Instead of doing that, the basic concept, again, very dumb. For us, the word dumb is not a pejorative term. Um, dumb was to pick the entire thing up, spin several of the components, in this case, the two hotels, underneath to actually miss all the various things that are at grade, reposition things at top to maximize either the rental or their sales prices, and reconnect them with circulation. And the result is that. Now, to me, this is a great example, whereas if we had attempted quickly, doing quick architecture, Big Mac architecture, we would never have been able to come to this conclusion. Because if we had, we would have been shot out of the water. But because we arrived to it, it is through a series of really sort of bizarre observations about and I'll explain what those are in one moment, about how architecture can actually solve a series of economic problems. The amazing thing is no one ever looked at that and said, what the hell is it? They all just went, yeah, great, it works. It solves our problem. <laughs> We're like, wow, really? <laughs> and it comes down to the following. Here, here's the building. Um, two elements at the bottom. One was a Western hotel, and one was kind of homestay hotel. The big block on top was offices. The two other blocks were... Uh, luxury condos, and the thing in the center was all the public space of the project, all the complexity, including the Contemporary Art Institute. The reason that they bought into it were the following things. It was, the issued position were the first. We simply said, look, from a market standpoint, we will accept whatever the market dictates. 
So if the market says, I need 25,000 square foot office plates, we accepted it. If it said, hey, we need 85 uh, luxury condos, we accepted it. And we just allowed them to be the most platonic shape necessary in order to maximize the potential for financing. And we had confidence that we could come back and make a composition out of it that was going to be beautiful. The second was that by doing that, by keeping each of the towers discrete, we could actually let them fluctuate with the market. I mean, literally fluctuate with the market as we were designing. A project like this, one and a half million square feet, half billion dollars, would probably take two and a half year, years to three years to design, to go through all the design planning processes and everything else. Well, as a developer, that's horrifying because the market changes a lot faster than that and they're about to you know, go on the hook for a half billion dollars. This building could fluctuate. Every three months, the developer would come back to us and say, you know what? Housing market's getting soft. Uh, I need 20 fewer condos. And we, we come back and say, you know what? I actually need uh, 50,000 square feet, more feet of offices. Right? It just changed. In fact, it's the only time in my observation I've ever seen scripting work. Because it was just, we had a script, we would type in the parameters, and the drawing set would change immediately, and we'd keep designing. That was it. So over the life of the project, it was literally doing this as we were designing. Now, in terms of risk, what that means is that the risk went from three years to about three months, because three months would be the time it would take to say, finally, okay, we're ready to go, freeze the shape, send it to a wind tunnel test, get the information back, design the foundations, and then start construction. And then the third position was this. We would take all the complexity and dump it into the middle. That's about 15% of the project, and that would allow us to accelerate the other 85% such that we could start construction after only 14 months. So between those two things, imagine in terms of risk how this is an advantage. It reduces the, the market risk from three years to three months, and it pushes that three months from being three years out to 14 months out. That's why this was a home run from a developer standpoint, to the point that, as I said earlier, as bizarre a building as that is, the developer did not once talk about aesthetics with us. Never once was the debate of, oh, hey, I don't like the way it looks. He was just like, go, run. And that's actually a really strong position to be in. I would call that performance-based architecture. Uh, here you see the different galleries in the center. Uh, one of the original charges of the couple client is that they wanted the art to be literally, not just metaphorically, but literally at the center. They wanted the art to be operating on everyday life. They also needed it to be climate controlled and security controlled. So we were trying to figure out ways to do that. And again, we found a very kind of simple, done solution. And it has to do with technology that 3M was doing in the 90s. 3M wants to sell uh, plastics and advertising. We wanted people to see in. But 3M did a lot of research on how the cones and rods in our eyes work. And they figured out that there was a pattern that actually confuses our brain. And it was a pattern such that if it was any color other than black, our mind fills in what it's seeing. So in this case, you generally see something white as a white surface. On the other hand, if you use black, your eye fills it in with what's behind it. it. Has a very simple, subtle pattern that they figured out. So in fact, from one side it's opaque and one side it's transparent without any moving parts. And there you see the effect. So we made it black on one side, white on the other, and that meant that inside the gallery, in the center of the building, which you see in the lower, you get a kind of a little bit of a ghosting of all the other activities, the uh, restaurants and the bar and the gym and other things happening on the outside of the art. But when you're, so there you see inside the gallery. But when you're in all those ancillary things, you would actually see the art. And this became a really important tool when we were negotiating the management services agreement. And imagine an architect sitting at a table with a developer as well as the people who are going to be leasing parts of the building. And it's the architect who's driving the show. And the reason we could drive the show is we would say to Western Hotel, hey, look, we've come up with a design in which normally you charge 18 bucks for a ribeye. Well, how much would you charge for that ribeye if you can see the deconing show? And they'd go, oh, 25 bucks. And we're like, okay, great, 25 bucks. How about we split the difference? Right, that's $7. You take 350, our institution takes 350, and guess what? Now our institution doesn't need to take tickets. It's got its own revenue generation out of the design of the architecture. Again, that's what I would call performance-based architecture. So here you see, this is literally what was suggested, swimming pool that would be looking into the lower gallery. And that's the final. Now, something happened during all these projects we started to notice about flexibility. 
What we noticed more and more was that the idea of universal flexibility, you know, I'll make a space where anything can happen, it never worked. And the reason it never worked, and you can see it, I won't go into it, but if you, if you look at Seattle, you look at Dallas, you look at Museum Plaza, you can see that more and more we were focusing on kind of compartments of, of very specific things that would do specific things. And we found that we were getting much more traction in terms of flexibility than universals. And this is the way we eventually tried to diagram it, to say, when you have a universal, what tends to happen is you do something in it, and then it becomes very expensive to do anything else. And so you leave it, and you sort of move it off center. Best example I can give, how many people here have ever been to the Centre Pompidou? How many of you have ever seen the Centre Pompidou in a different configuration? So there's a building that they literally doubled the construction cost so they could change everything. And they've never done it, because it's too expensive. What museum in the world has the operational budgets to go and move walls around every three weeks? Nobody. So our observation was, hey, that's not a really good way to have flexibility. A much better way is to say, hey, take the spectrum, and do a bunch of very specific things extremely well, and each one of those can get pushed off center a little bit, and lo and behold, you actually have real flexibility, true universal flexibility. So with that in mind, um, you know, people often ask us, how do you do competitions? They don't have clients. When we do competitions, we will take an idea like this and we'll make it our client. In this case, this is a, a project in which we use that basic concept as, and this competition is a test bed for it. Uh, this was the competition for the new Edvard Monk Museum. I'm going to show you a series of uh, projects which we've come in second. We seem to be really good at losing and coming in second all the time. Um, this was a project that, in fact, we had won it seven years before over here in a different harbor. And after working on it for seven years, they then decided that they wanted to move it to this harbor. And they asked us if we wanted to do the new competition. Um, then we came in second in a major international competition. And I, honest, I, I have to admit that I went to the mayor, who I'd gotten to know very well, and I said, you know, Paradella, look, um, we won the first one. We came in second, second time. Don't you think that, like, doesn't that mean we're the right people for it? And he was like, no, no. <laughs> um, so the competition was to, here, again, I don't think my pointer is working very well, but it was to do uh, the Monk Museum right here. The interesting thing, this, you know, Oslo is a city of about half a million people. And look at all the architecture that was going on here. Uh, this is the new opera house done by Snow Hetta. Uh, they were doing the new city library here. Friends of mine, Space Group, were doing the new central station here. MVRDV had just finished the master plan for the barcode here, and they were doing a series of buildings plus five other architects. Our reaction was, this is way too much architecture for one little harbor in one tiny little city. We called it the architecture zoo. And we didn't want to play. So the entire basis of our competition entry was, let's not play on form. Because look, that thing, it just won the Mies van der Rohe prize. So we're going to do something here to compete? That's dumb. That's a good way to lose. So let's compete not with signature form, but signature performance. How can we make something perform so incredibly well that it holds the same space in the city's mind's eye as something that is formally very exciting to the city. And that brought us to this notion of kind of yin and yang between the two buildings. Um, there you see them in the end. But let me talk about what are the underlying issues and positions. Um, since 1914, with the white cube, this is the, the be all and end all of museum design, a white box. Problem with a white box is that it's very, very, very expensive to run. Why? Because there's no such thing as white box art. You have to create something in that white box every time you do it. And that takes operational budgets. And we've already kind of hammered to death tonight already. People don't have operational budgets anymore. So that's a problem. So our question was, using this idea of presets, could we actually give them a series of tools that already gives them diversity and difference within a single museum such that they don't need an operational budget to actually have vibrancy and uniqueness within the museum. That was the first position. And the second one was an observation about contemporary museum design, which we called the pearl necklace, the idea that you have a lobby and then you have a string of galleries that come back to the lobby. There's two problems with it. The first is the moment you attempt to install anything in there, you have, you're basically cutting the pearl necklace. So you have to shut the entire museum down. 
And the second is, it's completely inflexible in terms of the size of the show. They must do blockbuster show after blockbuster show after blockbuster show. They can't do one small show. They can't do five small shows. They can't do one big one and two small ones. It's got to be blockbuster after blockbuster. Best example, the Guggenheim. You know, F Frank Lloyd Wright should be shot. What a nightmare that building is. They, they, that is a museum staff that is tortured. They are constantly under the fear of how are we going to keep this thing alive. So our response was, why don't you take the circulation and put it to the perimeter, put the installation spaces in the center, and put all those presets around the outside of it. Here you see the lower plan. You would enter, the art would come in, go into an assembly area, into an elevator here, totally secure, and go directly into the center of the structure. And it looks something like that. Right? So you have, it's a nine square grid, has eight different gallery types, and I'll describe what they are in a center, in, in the center, uh, in a second, and the installation space in the center, and all of the public circulation, the public zones, everything else with the great views to the fjord around the perimeter. So we have these eight different galleries. We defined each one in turn. This one was sort of like the main classical museum that was in Oslo. This one was a crib off of Monk's own galleries in Eckley, including an open air gallery that he did most of his painting in. Uh, we did one that was sort of like a Frick gallery. We did one that was like any number of um, uh, Gary Galleries. We did a ripoff of the Neue National Gallery. Um, we did a Chelsea Gallery. Uh, we did one that was any number of one million Renzo Piano accordion galleries. And then we cribbed our own museum in the Guggenheim in Las Vegas. And there you see the idea of this kind of open public space around the perimeter. And you see three of the different galleries with their very discrete architectural expression on the exterior of it. But as a tool, this was the intent. Now, one thing I need to say is they gave us, the, as a program, they said we need five-eighths of the gallery to be classical, and we need three-eighths of the gallery to be contemporary. And we thought, you know, that we should be able to go beyond that. So as a tool, this would be able to give them eight-eighths of the gallery can be done, used as one enormous show. They can also do eight discrete shows. And they can also do any kind of combination or permutation of any of those by people moving into the gallery, back out, and having a kind of aperitif of seeing the, the fjord on the outside and back into another one. In terms of the ultimate flexibility, though, it's important to look at the flexibility that was engendered in th four of the eight galleries. Again, they wanted five-eighths to be classical, three-eighths to be contemporary. We said, well, if we can actually pre-design the flexibility of those, we can do eight-eighths, or maybe it's seven-eighths, six-eighths contemporary, and two-eighths classical but we can also do five-eighths classical. And so it gave them their program and it gave them something else. Didn't hamstring them with a set configuration. And we went a step further and said, hey, you're about to build what you think is gonna be a state-of-the-art museum, which doesn't have the one thing every state-of-the-art museum needs to have, which is a gallery the same size as the Tate's Turbine Hall or MoMA's main gallery space. And so the flexibility went a step further and provided that as well. In this case, what we're doing is, again, the idea of presets, but also that each of the presets is malleable such they get much, a much stronger tool than what they originally conceived of. And there you see the kind of weirdness of all these different galleries around the center. Uh, we put a huge photovoltaic roof on it so it would be black, and that was a nice contrast to the white uh, opera house next to it. And there you see it in the fjord. I just like that section. Uh, there you see it at night. And then one of the concerns was that our building, based on where we sited it, would actually block the fjord from the roof of the uh, opera house. And so this is a rendering to prove to the city council members that that wasn't the case. So we didn't win that one. Now I'm going to show you how the idea evolved, one that we also didn't win. Uh, this was for the V&A uh, extension in Dundee in Scotland. A very exciting site because they said build it in the middle of the water. Um, programmatically, you know, so there's just a big chunk of stuff, but programmatically they actually had, oops, four different pockets of program. Um, part of it was uh, exhibition space, part of it was a kind of interiorized urban realm for the city. Uh, they had a ground floor marshalling area, and then something that was to incubate design in Scotland. Those are the four components. Um, our strategy was to stack them. I'll say why in a second. Most importantly, it had to do with this. Again, a competition, we wanted to carry our own ideas further from the Monk competition. So the, we want to organize all five of the galleries on one floor for two reasons. One, 
as we've already said, we wanted to, to undo this idea of the pearl necklace and actually organize them in a way in which you could have one gallery used or all five galleries used, you could have a big show, a small show, and so forth, and with that uh, facility area in the center. But the second is that in museums, what drives thermal load is not the exterior. In most projects you want to be, in terms of energy performance, you want to minimize surface area. In a museum it's not true, because so much of the energy load has to do with artificial lighting. If you can put all the galleries up under the roof, you can make a very inefficient shape that actually far surpasses the energy, load, the energy use of a much more efficient space. So we wanted to take all these galleries and organize them on one floor and to put them at the top. And that's why the exhibition space in this cube is like that. The machinations we went through is we put all the galleries at the top. They were the biggest, so we stretched the cube at the top. Uh, it was in the middle of the water, so we wanted to reduce the footprint as much as possible because obviously building in the middle of an active uh, riparian way is not a very cost-effective thing to do. So we squeezed the marshalling area as small as possible. Um, we created a very simple structural system of a structural kind of dowel in the center with a series of trusses going out that created a tabletop so that we could organize these galleries at will to make the ultimate shape. We then kind of crimped it to make a series of lateral braces that worked very uh, efficiently from a structural standpoint, but also and that's really learning from the Seattle Library. Also created a very interesting shape. We covered it in mirror glass so that it would reflect the water. This kind of, so the building would become just this shimmering thing in the water. That also has a great deal to do with uh, reducing the heat gain of the building, which even in Scotland is important, because even in the summer, thermal load in Scotland is a significant design factor. Uh, as I've already foreshadowed, that allowed us to use natural daylighting in all the galleries, it allowed us to create a huge surface to collect water, it allowed us to have a huge surface to uh, do photovoltaic energy generation, uh, as I said previously, which also is very important for sustainability in museums. Um, that centralized core was an ideal way to our, uh, naturally ventilate the building so we didn't have to force air. Uh, the notion of a building that was organized as a centralized core is very good for natural daylighting. Blah, 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 that's the finished result. Again, I don't think you could, well, you might. You might sketch something like that, but I don't think you could actually do it for the $32 million that they were asking us to do it for. And now if you x-rayed it, you said that each one of these floors became typologically different, uh, not just in terms of how it was used, but also its structural system. Um, so if you look, there's the section going from bottom to top, that's the marshalling area. And this is something that we happen to like. It's a bit of a trope for us, but we like this idea that every plan becomes its own animal. So this was the main public area. This was the incubator for Scottish design. These are the galleries. Now if I turn everything off and open up all the doors, now you can actually see what's the flexibility we were proposing. The original program had four galleries. We actually made one of them actually into two. By that we could then do four galleries, we could do three galleries, we could do one major gallery, we could do five galleries. Again, this idea taken off of the Monk Museum. And we came in second. Now, now I'm going to do a happier story. Um, yeah, we're getting quite late. I, at some point, I may just skip one or two projects, but we'll see how it goes. Um, this is a project close to you. It was for Caltech in Pasadena. Uh, exciting project. I'm not sure if you know anything about Caltech, but they get 10 times the federal support per capita of any other institution of higher education in the United States. That's nutso. I don't know how they've managed to score that much money, but they do. And it's in Pasadena, which has a perfect climate. And this is the site here. And then they asked us to do what they called an information science technology building, which really is like code for, let's take that, all the Nobel Prize winners from each one of the major departments and stick them all into one building, just see what the hell happens. That was the concept. Now, what was funny is that it kept talking about it being the center of, this, of the campus, and it wasn't in the center of the campus because that was this very funny kind of uh, nouveau modern building in the in center of the building, uh, center of the campus, which I'll show in a second. Um, and it was Caltech, and so we did a, you know, they wanted us to use technology that they had to experiment with new materials. They were very into this notion of um, 
research space that was highly collaborative that could be redefined as the ultimate concept was to have a core of recitation areas of, of auditoria in the center, but then have a huge plate that could be totally reconfigured based on how the guy from applied and computational mathematics was working with experimental physics. And they would, you know, suddenly combine for three years and then their research would go in different ways and they split apart again. So it was that, um, it was covered in this big uh, canopy of it was a material that they were developing that we were very excited to be the first to start to use. It looked like a big uh, wasp's nest. Um, you know, it was kind of ugly, uh, which we also like. We tend to like things that are awkward. And we took it all the way through concept design. Everything was great. Dr. Baltimore, the president of Caltech, loved it. The faculty loved it. Um, they approved concept design. We were just about to start schematic design. They said, oh, wait, we forgot to mention, uh, you need to get um, Pasadena Design Commission approval. <laughs> we're like, excuse me, what? Like, who? And you didn't think we should know that before we started designing? Like, oh, yeah, we've, yeah, it's just this little thing that you have to go through. Don't worry about it. So we go through and we present it. And the board says, no, 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 no. It's got to be Spanish style. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know how to do Spanish style. I don't know the first thing about Spanish style. So thinking that I'm really cute, I went to Dr. Baltimore, who's much smarter than I am, Nobel Prize winner, not. And I say, hey, Dr. Baltimore, I got a great idea. How about we do our building? And you go down the road to somebody in Pasadena who knows how to do Spanish style, and they'll do a Spanish style enclosure on our building. That'll be really weird, really cool, contradictory, kind of uh, you know, postmodern. That's exciting. And he said, no, no. See, problem is, Josh, you've been telling me for a year before we hired you, it's why we hired you, that you know, constraints are the mother of innovation. Here's a constraint, right? Isn't this right up your alley? Yeah. So panic time. So f for the architects in the audience, you'll know what the panic time is. Students, I'll tell you why. There's a gray area between concept design and schematic design where you can't quite figure out who's on the hook for redesign. Is it you or them? Because arguably, they could just simply say, well, you didn't actually meet our needs or our program or whatever it is. You don't want to piss them off by trying to throw the contract in their face. So now you're in this, you know, it's too early in the marriage to start bickering. So you're redesigning. And we spent three weeks redesigning and couldn't figure out what to do. And then I had an amazing aha moment. I watched The Matrix. <laughs> so kids trying to bend the spoon. Neo says what? What's the problem? Ah, there is no spoon. That's the answer. The answer was, we shouldn't redesign our building. It wasn't the problem. The problem is the design commission. Let's redesign the design commission. <laughs> so we asked Dr. Baltimore to use his cloud to get us first on the agenda on a day that we knew that they were going to have to approve 70 garage editions. You can imagine, sorry, the shit show that is. We were first. So we went in with two slides. We said, hey, we're here to show you our redesign of our building. We had an audience kind of like this of really angry homeowners who have modernist houses who have to do Spanish style additions and they don't know why. And <laughs> this is the first slide that we showed them. We said, hey, Pasadena Design Commission, all these people in the audience, they've got modernist buildings and they're pissed. And I can understand why, because if I look at the campus, and I look at what you've been regulating for the last 80 years, I see Spanish style, but I also see modernist, I see some brutalist, I see some neo-modernist, I see some bad. <laughs> but I actually don't see that you've done a really good job of regulating Spanish style for the last 80 years. And in fact, if you squint, the only thing it seems to me you've done is regulate beige. And beige is the color of that beautiful new material that Caltech is developing. So you should let us do our building. All hell broke loose. <laughs> and they asked us to leave. And that was it. And we kind of didn't know, like, we fired. We didn't, we didn't hear anything from Caltech for about a week and a half. And then the head of PR called me up and said, well, we got a letter from the design commission today. And they said, go away. Here's the deal. Whatever you do, three stories, austere, ground floor at arcade. Tell them that. Tell them to shut up and leave us alone. 
So we took our old building, you know, like those sea slugs who walk up to something and they eat it by actually inverting their entire body around it. That's what we did. We took our old project and we went and we did what we called the wolf in sheep's clothing building. We took the old thing that was on the outside and we put it in the inside and we made the thing that was a kind of austere little thing in the center. We made it the exterior of the building. So first we took all of the research areas and we made the world's most austere motel. Okay, C could not be more austere. It was post tension concrete slabs. There, there was nothing, there was no detail. In fact, it was like austere on acid. Exposed concrete ceiling, exposed concrete floor, exposed concrete structure. Uh, we had fan coil units on the wall that went directly to the outside, so there was no ductwork, there was no nothing, no detail, no anything. It was as austere as it could possibly be, and it would blow over in a wind. And then on the inside, we took all of the more exciting things, and instead of making the, them this kind of somber thing that we had before, we made it the dynamic thing. And it was a steel structure that held the concrete structure up. And all of you who are now in school, when you fold something, what happens to it? When you increase its what? Its moment of... <laughs> its moment of inertia. Okay, so you increase its stiffness when you fold it. So we're just using that idea, we started taking the plates, we started folding them, and we abided by the rules given by our structural engineer, which is that every floor on every face must have at least two, two folds per floor. And as long as we met that, we would make the ultimate braced frame, and that braced frame would support the thing on the exterior. Now the beauty of it is that if you switch any one of these things, it will collapse. And the reason that was important is remember, we've been designing at our own cost for about another three months, and I did not want to go through a whole other review process at my own cost with Caltech. So we presented it, and of course they said, well, we have to have our structure. And it, well, she said, first, they said, hey, can we take this and move it over here? And we're like, no, <laughs> it will fall apart. Like, no, that's not true. So they had their structural engineers look at it, and the structural engineers said, yeah, it'll fall apart. <laughs> so it, it enabled us to create something that we really liked. It was exciting, but it was also, in a way, uh, screw-proof, right? Got us to the next uh, step. Uh, it was exciting. Here you see one of the interior spaces. Uh, they would build it that way, so they would build this really kind of exciting steel folded plate thing in the center that was all the auditoria and everything else. And then on the exterior was this super lightweight post-tension concrete frame uh, that was three stories, austere, with a ground floor arcade. And those funny things sticking out of the top, we called them roof appurtenances, which for those of you who don't speak American building code, those are called chimneys. Um, there you see where it's supposed to go on the site. On the right, that is the last building they had finished in 2006, and it is a Spanish-style building, and that was our building next to it. And this is where the story gets sad. Um, Dr. Baltimore left, and our building was two weeks from starting construction. They had just started the Morphosis uh, Astrophysics Building. They had three more to go after us, and the new president was a kind of French curmudgeon who wasn't really into contemporary architecture, and he canned all the projects. And we didn't, it wasn't just like, hey, we'll call you later. We got a letter in the mail saying, don't ever call us again. <laughs> it's done. Thank you. It was fun. Um, and that was it. And that was it for three years. Until this man walked into our office during Fashion Week. Um, he is the owner and CEO of two companies. The first is Vaco, which is the preeminent fashion company in Turkey. Uh, and also Power Media, which is sort of like Turkish MTV. Uh, one of the things I really love about him and his company, is started by his father. They are a very prominent Jewish family in Istanbul. Uh, what I love about the story is that his father's established the company by being the first one to do really, really beautifully designed headdresses for Muslim women, which I just think is a beautiful story. And they still make them in the same antiquated way. They're incredible artisans, and that has important relevance to the project. Oop, oh, I just totally ruined the punchline. Forget that you saw that for a second. So, <laughs> um, he walked into our office with Giselle Bunchen in tow, because it was fashion week and she was his muse, and we, he, he's about this tall and she's about this tall. And we didn't look at him, we looked at her. <laughs> and he's talking, we're looking at her, he's talking. And at some point I realized this really affable, excited man is saying, we want you to design and construct a building for us in 11 months. Right. What? 11 months. I said, 
Uh, not really. That's not really possible. Turkish hashish must be really good. That ain't <laughs> happening. Um, this is the humor section of the lecture. I'll go back to being serious in a second. Uh, he says, no, no, don't, don't worry about it. Because I, you know, the backstory is his father had done a beautiful campus in the 50s. And the Turkish municipal, the, the Istanbul municipality suddenly announced at the beginning of Fashion Week, the beginning of the week, that they were going to bulldoze his, his headquarters down with eminent domain to put a freeway there. And he's a publicly held company. He's like, my company's going to go bankrupt if, if this were to happen. He said, they're going to do it in 11 months. So I need to unveil a new, really important piece of architecture the moment they do this to give confidence in my company. And if I don't, I'm screwed. I'm listening to him, I say, yeah, that's great, but you're asking us to do something that I don't think is really feasible. And he said, yeah, yeah, but don't worry about it because my cousin, who's the CFO of the company, yesterday he bought a building and it was a bones of a hotel that was meant to be built in the 80s and it's been sitting there for 25 years. So you just, you just use that. It'll be faster and cheaper. And I'm thinking, man, it just got worse. Like, <laughs> and he says, yeah, yeah, but here, here's the building. And he puts it on the table, he shows me the picture. I, started cracking up because it's a three-story austere building with a ground floor arcade if I've ever seen one. <laughs> so that was on a Friday. I had to have dinner with him and Giselle. And then on Sunday, we flew to Turkey. We got there on Monday. On Tuesday, we went to see the building. On Tuesday, we met with his structural engineers. The thing on the left, that is the floor plan of the building. And that was the floor plan of our building for which we had construction documents. So we sat down, we figured out on Tuesday how to start, how to transform their building into our building. And on Wednesday, they started construction on the ring. <laughs> now, the problem is that's great for the ring, but we've got two months before they had to start building the interior of the building. And the problem was the inverse problem. In Caltech, we had a very muscular interior holding up a lightweight concrete exterior. Here, in Turkey, because of really horrible earthquakes and because labor is so cheap, they over-design things because it's cheap that way. And in fact, if they discover that something isn't going to pencil out, they just walk away from it. So the, the landscape in Turkey, in Istanbul in particular, is covered with what I call bones. Projects that developers started where they just said, you know, it's not going to pencil out. I've got, you know, half a million dollars put in it because it's so cheap for them. They just walk away from it. Now, this project, because of the earthquakes, like most projects in Turkey, is way, way over-designed. And we had to come up with a way to put the super lightweight and steel interior on uh, in a way that wouldn't engage the exterior. Because right? we don't have any time to do forensic analysis. We've got a structure, and we don't know its dynamic action in an earthquake. And we're going to build something out of steel on the inside. And the two simply must move independently of each other. So it's the absolute inverse problem from Caltech. Uh, using what we learned from the Seattle Library, we took the program, we just developed a series of steel boxes. After two weeks, we sent those to the mill order. Uh, we would get the steel back in six weeks. And then we designed those boxes such that they could be put together in any configuration. You could put them like this, like this, like this. They would always hold up. And you'd be able to just bolt them together. We had six weeks until the steel showed up while they were finishing the ring. And as a side note, we designed those things such that you could put them on angles so they could become the primary circulation. And we just started playing, playing like hell, so that in six weeks' time, we knew how, when the steel started showing up the site, how to erect it. There you see the basic concept of using the boxes opportunistically. This was the one that we picked. You could call that's the part that we designed. And that's how it would sit or look on the inside of, of the existing building. And they literally built it that way. So they would build a box, and they would pick it up, and they'd bring it in fully formed and drop it in. So there you see, that's, I think, the fourth box. That's the toilet box. Uh, there's the auditorium below. That's the um, meeting box. Uh, that's the showroom box. And that's the headquarters on top. They built the entire steel structure in one week. And going from bottom to top, here you see the museum, the auditorium. Uh, this is now walking on top of the rooftop of, to the auditorium to the first level of the offices going through one of the showrooms, up to the second level of offices, up to the meeting box, meeting box, they set it out of order, and then up to a roof terrace, that's the headquarters at the top, and there's Jim in his office. So 
uh, one of the beautiful things that we learned about a project of this speed was that time can actually be, um, here, here's a whole argument about being slow, but in this case, speed was actually an interesting advantage because we would present things that were crazy and Jem would say, I need to think about it. We'd be like, you don't got time to think about it. <laughs> but one of the things we proposed was that we would cover the entire th thing in the center with mirror glass. We thought it was funny because we liked the idea of Giselle, this is actually a real photograph. That's not doctored in any way. That's not doctored. Uh, we just like the idea of Giselle being, you know, replicated a million times through the building. <laughs> so there's the thing we designed. And then this, the last thing I'm going to say about this project was the unique exterior. Um, you know, Jim, we had incredible synergy, sympathy with him. Uh, there you see the building completed. But he was very focused on something we were uncomfortable with. He kept saying, you know, I want the facade to be a facade like, in this case, uh, Louis Vuitton or Coach, you know, where, where the facade is the logo. And we're like, you know, Jim, we don't, that makes us uncomfortable. We've got to come up with a way to do something extraordinary that isn't just facadism. Um, and what we focused on was the fact that we couldn't make that horrible existing building go away. It was way over designed and we we're never going to make it disappear. So we said to Jem, you're actually doing something remarkable. You're taking a horrible building that's a blight on the countryside that you live in and you're turning it into something that's exciting. You should be proud of it because that's actually at the absolute root of sustainability, right? Taking something that is there and making something amazing out of it, you should be proud of it. You should showcase it. So how could we do that? One way of doing it would be what we called saran wrap. Wrap the building in something so thin that it revealed the existing structure and he could be proud of it. He wasn't so sure at first, I'll explain in a second how we got him to agree. Now we're gonna go back to moment of inertia. When you have a piece of plate glass, it's thick. You put a mullion around it, it gets thinner. If you could actually slump the ideal structural dimension into that glass, it can become super thin, i.e. it becomes saran wrap. With that in mind, one thing to remember is that this building, again, I said we didn't know anything about its dynamic action, so the only way we could put the glass on the side of the building and be sure it wouldn't explode in an earthquake was with four pins, two constrained and two that would float. Well, four pins, the ideal way to put a piece of structure between four pins is an X. So if we could slump an X into the glass, we could make it incredibly, incredibly thin. Now, operating in Istanbul, in Turkey, is very exciting right now because they're at the moment of their industrial revolution, so they have incredible technology. At the same time, they still have a great craftsman class. So they could slump the glass at a very highly controlled way, and they had the artisans to make these kinds of jigs to do it. And it was through the meeting of those two things that we created what we've called saran wrap. Now, this piece of glass, it is five sorry, four foot eight by 12 feet tall, and it's three eighths of an inch thick. And it's basically like it's not there. There you see it obliquely. So that's the end of that. Oh, here, there's, you see the building here, just to give you that, that's the blue mosque right there. And then again, just to plug that whole concept of sustainability, this is what we think sustainability is. All right, two, two last projects, I'm gonna do them very fast. One is another competition we just came in second on, and the other is a project that we're in schematic design on. Um, I'll start with a joke. What do you get when you cross Mies with Archigram? Um, this is a project in Shenzhen. Um, it was for two of the most important banks in China. They wanted to do, I don't know why people would want, they wanted to do a classic American plinth and tower building. And they kept saying how they wanted it to have an air of seriousness about it. And they were very prescriptive about actually forcing us into the confines of an American typology that we were very critical of. So our whole process was how to, un, how to meet the obligation while undoing the negative repercussion of it. So we sized the towers to be ideal profit machines in terms of their layout. Uh, actually, that can be done, or in fact, is ideally done if you can do it with two cores. It actually works extremely well. So we made a series of slab, thin slab buildings with multiple cores in them. And then we jacked them way up in the air. And we jacked them up in the air 
so that we could maximize their views, maximize their real estate value, maximize their daylight. And then we would take the plinth that they were prescribing to us at the base and turn them up because we've now made a huge amount of area that they didn't anticipate, though we stayed within the zoning envelope, kind of programmatic billboards. We would take all the other stuff and kind of stick it up in the center so you could actually see it. So it wouldn't be like a shop American shopping mall. And it would be a, a wall of restaurants and gyms and galleries and so forth. And that would help us to take a very dense area of downtown Shenzhen and make it more into a real living room in the city, which is what they kept saying they wanted, but they were driving it as kind of a suburban American typology. And then we repositioned the two towers in order to maximize uh, solar relationships between them, and that's the building. There you see it's in its or buildings. Um, now, what was exciting to us was using a very simple structural technique that we had been developing. We actually first played with it on the Wiley Theater. In fact, maybe even earlier on uh, Seattle. Uh, that you could get this kind of free-form programmatic play at the base of the building if you design the top element as we call a launch pad truss. Basically, a big, massive truss that makes a new flat slab that you can construct a very, very conventional building on top of. So we built a very conventional office building up in the air effectively, and that allowed us to infill it at will, do whatever we want to, very playful structural components in the billboard areas in the top seven floors of the building. So there you see these are the uh, kind of profit machine of the towers, and then this is all the unique components that happen at the base that had underneath the launch pad trusses. The, these two elements, these are the launch pad trusses. They were both gyms as per the program, but we used them to become the structural element that supported what was above it. And there you see the end result. Uh, and again, the idea, we, we like this idea of radically different typological organizations underneath the building as you go through it. So there you see the two towers next to each other. One of them was uh, stone and one of them was aluminum. This is the base, and you get this very sort of distinct typological difference that was in the middle of the building and then the offices at the top of the building. Okay, last project. Um, another architectural zoo. This is a project that we're working with 18 other architects from around the world. It is a master plan done by Daniel Liebeskind in the center of Seoul. This is Yongsan Central Station. That is the central station of all of Seoul, and this are all of the train tracks uh, currently for Korean Rail, right in the middle of the city. And they were going to develop a $30 billion development uh, with a series of signature towers by all different kinds of people from around the world. Um, I hope I'm not totally hiding my uh, frustration with the concept of the architecture zoo. And what was funny is that we were given the one side, one plot on the wrong side of the tracks. And the reason for that is that in order to do this big development, there's a whole bunch of housing projects here that are currently low-income housing that will get destroyed to do this, and they're being done with eminent domain. And this is for a, a, a private development. So you can imagine the political problem of for-profit development getting the right to destroy somebody's house. But the way they're doing it is they're going to take all these people and they're going to put them on the wrong side of the tracks in our building. But in our building... They don't necessarily think that these people will want to stay in the building because the value is going to go way up. So they want us to design units that are at the dimension they currently have, which are 40 to 60 square meters. So that's 400 to 600 square feet, which is basically the size of a hotel room. But they want it to design it as luxury housing, which is bizarre. Right? So our challenge was design luxury housing of this dimension, of which the vast majority is actually 400 square feet. It's kind of bizarre. Um, in Korea, like everywhere, but there it's, it's very prescribed what they determine value as. Value is natural daylight, cross-ventilation, and view. And I, that sounds like, yeah, of course, but actually the reason it's so important there is that the government fixes the cost of real estate. You don't compete based on, I give you a better product and I can charge more. It's all going to be the same, the way you compete is everyone saturates the market, and whoever gives the best thing in the market is the one who sells. So they have very prescribed ways of determining those things of value, and then, of course, they also want to engender a sense of community. Um, if we had obliged by the standard tower with such a tiny unit, 
you wouldn't be able to achieve any of those things. You'd have no view, no daylight, and no cross ventilation. And all the public amenity would be at the base of the building. So the challenge that we put back was, could we take the conventional housing tower, which is very prescriptive in Korea, and stretch it, stretch it out, and turn it into something kind of like that? Right, so we have super long, thin units. Oops, let's go back one. Where if you do x-ray, you see that each unit is absurd in its dimension. It's super long and narrow, has an enormous amount of daylight on both sides, has cross ventilation, uh, and therefore also view. And now you create this kind of uber courtyard in the center for the sense of community. And that's the result of it. And then the courtyard in the interior. Uh, and then we pushed and pulled all the different elements in order to make sure that no element ever blocked out uh, natural daylight of any other element. Uh, we created a structural cage on the interior of the building that would support everything so we could create the appearance of really dramatic cantilevers without the cost of dramatic cantilevers. And we inserted over the top of it a structural shelf into which we inserted a series of wood um, compartments. And each wood compartment is defined uh, with a bathroom on one side and a kitchen on the other side and then a movable uh, reflective steel element on the center. And that steel element in one configuration makes a bedroom and the other configuration makes a living room. And that was something that we had done in Seattle. Seattle, we used compact shelving in order to have a shop that then would close up at night for security reasons. So we were using the same technology. So here you see the movable shelf. That's it in the bedroom configuration. And then from the other side, that's it in the living room configuration. All right, so there you see the side of the building. The, the units are truly absurdly tiny. Um, that was in the bedroom configuration. Now it's in the living room configuration. And that's probably how you would see it on any given day. Uh, these are the units, 40 square meters, bedroom configuration, living room configuration. And then you see kind of the absurdity of how they're organized. Right? So it's like an insanely, insanely, it's 20, the entire lot, the ring is only 24 feet wide. Right? So it's, including the corridor, it's probably here to that wall. And the units are maybe one and a half times that long. And that's the courtyard in the center. And then almost done. This gives you some sense of both the transparency between the units, but also the sort of absurd drama that you get. And so each one is like a little picture box. So there you see the building and in situ. All right, so last, I'll just finish again. The, what I wanted to drive home with the concept of slow architecture is this idea of allowing ideas to gestate, understanding that design is iterative, understanding that great design should actually be the result of simultaneously trying to manipulate both the constraints and your agenda, and that if you can do it in a way that as I said before, eschews conventional thinking, right? finds very specific, very tailored responses, you will come up with solutions that I believe will always be dramatic in terms of their aesthetic and their formal repercussion. And in that sense, they perform at every level. They are formally exciting, they are functionally exciting, and hence they are performative architecture. Thank you. <laughs>